Okay, so exactly what uh, kind of physics do we get from, uh, let's say, a believer versus an unbeliever, or uh, someone who believes in uh, billions and billions of years as opposed to somebody who believes in a 6,000-year-ago creation? Okay, now, to answer that question would really require a lifetime, uh, to be honest with you, so let me give you just a few examples of uh, of uh, of uh, what what uh, what what I what, what I got from God with the uh, six thousand year, uh, along with uh, a lot of other people with whom I worked, uh, such as uh, Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac, Nobel laureate, who discovered the positron and uh, and and well predicted and <laughs> the positron uh, as a theorem by the way, and who proved that it existed as a theorem, along with the electron. That's, that, that was before we were born. Uh, that was way, 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 way back there, 1923 uh, A.D., okay? Uh, that's, that's one guy we get, we get. Now, that was before we were born, and that's what he got. Uh, and, and he kept looking for that. And other other guys, he was a he was a Fermi on. Uh, he liked uh, he liked uh, uh, he was he was a Fermi Dirac guy. He he loved spin one half particles. Uh, so so he went after them with his uh, with his uh, uh, Dirac equation. He got these guys known as creation and annihilation operators, which got Heitler uh, uh, in 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 his uh, his uh, uh, you know atomic theory of radiation. Which uh, of course gave us X-rays. So, you know, these these go back. Uh, he, the first X-ray machine came from Heitler's work, uh, uh, which came from uh, Dirac's work, and so 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 we, we get a lot of stuff. Uh, Enrico Fermi got a lot of stuff, uh, as did Niels Bohr. Uh, good grief, I, I can't even begin to enumerate the accomplishments of Dirac Bohr. Uh, then, of course, there was a guy that one of my major professors brought to the U.S. in 1929, a good old guy by the name of Al Einstein. Einstein was Albert Einstein was really his name. Viennese pronunciation, accent on the last syllable, not the first, as, as one would ordinarily think in, in, in German. It, in German, one would think Ein, Einstein, but it's Einstein and uh, Viennese. Okay, so anyway, uh, we're all familiar with uh, the work in relativity theory, and that held for a while, but there was one problem. Uh, the constancy of the speed of light was to be questioned when something was noticed by uh, some other guys, Yang and Li, uh, who, who, who found out that, by gosh, parity is not conserved in the universe. In other words, wait a minute, we switch spatial directions, we, we have to have a proper choice of orientation. There's a, there's a young Lee field that's running around with, with, with three vector bosons. You've got to be kidding. What is this? And it's, it's one-seventeenth the strength of the gravitational field which really isn't a very strong field at a distance, so, so it's a very, very tiny field existing throughout the universe. It could, it could be observed barely. Uh, it's very difficult to work into the physical theories, but it's considered the fifth fundamental force. And so, good grief, and these guys get a Nobel Prize for that. I mean, you know, I, I, so anyway... I, Going on, let, let's see. Now that's what that's what happened. That's what happened before I was born, and up to the time I was a, a little child. Uh, okay. So so let's see. Later on, as I said, I, I got to work with Evgeny Mikhailovich Lipschitz, and uh, of course he was a Nobel laureate, and so he got some results by working on the six thousand year assumption as well. Uh, a lot of these a lot of these guys were uh, were Christians. Uh, and, and uh, so anyway, uh, we worked on alternate cosmologies, and, and we found alternate cosmologies. We found other ways of explaining uh, equivalent explanations with, with you know, this, this, uh, this, this, this 6,000-year model. Sort of, you can think of it this way, sort of thoughts between when we pause, 
what are we thinking about when we pause to clear our minds? And that's what these alternate cosmologies are. What, what, this sort of pauses, uh, this sort of the spaces that exist and the pauses of our consideration of the entire creation that uh, God has beset us with. But let's see, what happened, uh, what happened uh, uh, was in 1977, what did I get? Uh, well, I was able to show that the speed of light varies. And Steven Weinberg uh, was uh, was uh, extremely uh, mystified by that because it was unheard of. It had to be uh, the speed of light had to be a constant. The average, the mean speed of light had to be constant. No, if Weinberg's electroweak uh, notions had any any weight, carried any weight whatsoever, no, 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 no. They were no longer uh, sacred constants. That meant. Planck's constant varied as well. You've got to be kidding. Planck's constant, the, the fundamental Planck's constant, now Planck variable. That affects everything from 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 Bezin quantization, where we now have a Planck variable running around, not a Planck constant, but a Planck variable. And and then and then and then and then that causes the universal gravitational constant to vary. That causes the, the the proton mass, the neutrino mass, the 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 the, 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 the pion mass, uh, everything that everything that we find when we start crunching atoms, and we start crunching uh, uh, the, the the nucleons, uh, you know, uh, well, good grief, everything. You mean they're variable? Yes. And who was the first? You're talking to the guy who predicted mass of neutrinos. That was verified by the University of Tokyo. God gave me uh, that weird idea, uh, and it was it was uh, you know as I said I can't take credit for everything, but this is this is what God gave me uh, to give to other people. Okay, this is what God gave me to share. Yeah, back in back in the seventies, I was a crazy guy running around talking about variable speed of light, variable variable masses of neutrinos. And once, and then I was able to show this weird result that all mass in the universe can be normalized to unity. A constant one, even if the system is massless. Now think about that one. How can, how can, how can, how can we have one unit of mass if there's nothing there? <clears throat> well, I'll leave that for people to perpend, to, uh, to muse or, so to speak, uh, you know, just sort of think about that one. Because it's not really an insolubilium. It's one of those riddles I'll, I'll leave people with for the moment. We'll come back to that question at a later time. And um, and I'll, I'll answer that in, in, in a little bit more detail. But so what do we find? And all of this has been verified by the Hubble telescope, by other high-energy astrophysical probes, by, by universities. Uh, who conducts uh, experiments in high energy physics and medium energy physics and, and extremely low energy physics uh, and, and and other areas? Uh, so we're not talking about things that uh, we're talking about theorems. Which, my gosh, this can't be a theorem. We've got to we've got to really check it out. So yeah, neutrinos do have mass, and 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 the, the speed of light does vary. And uh, from, from from as I said, what do you get? You get a lot of crank calls from people who want to kill you for having messed up uh, ABC Nightline on uh, on uh, you know that aired from 10:30 uh, my time till 11:30 uh, every night. They would they got sick and tired, bored with the uh, new images from Hubble that were predicted. Why? Because some crazy people decided to assume the universe was approximately 6,000 years old. In so doing, <clears throat> well, a few constants got, a few things got, sh sh well, you shrink the time, things can get closer, so to speak, and by golly, you can see a little bit further into the universe. Uh, especially if you try to look through your father's eyes, and your father is, in this case, your father in heaven. Um, so, anyway, you go off 
on tangents like what does this have to do with the human body and uh, why do you develop a field known as neurophysics? Uh, and then you come back to mathematical uh, notions and physical notions and, 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 and notions in chemistry. And then finally there was uh, the discovery of this question, this riddle, uh, which has become an industrial panacea. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's something that uh, is now seen as C60, the buckyball. Uh, the carbon 60 is, uh, is one of the uh, 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 new boys, new players in the petrochemical and the, uh, the, the hydrocarbon and the uh, alternate energy, uh, alternate energy uh, 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 business uh, or technology or whatever we're calling it now. Corporation is a better word for it, perhaps, but maybe that's too more, uh, sardonic. I don't know. Perhaps I should apologize for that. So we keep going on and going on and going on. We could, uh, we could, well, you know, gee. Uh, well, then there's finally a guy uh, that came out of particle hole conjugation when when it was found that uh, fermions and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, bosons could be identified. Uh, it gave me an idea. God gave me another weird idea, and that was to treat uh, creation and annihilation operators in the sense of Paul Dirac as uh, as uh, as connections uh, in the sense of differential geometry. Uh, connections on vector bundles, uh, Hilbert space bundles. And what happened then? We had the photon and the cophoton, essentially two alternate descriptions. One is an incoming photon being absorbed, and the other one is a photon being emitted. Yet we put them into a pair, and then we were able to look at that. With sufficient knowledge, we knew how to quantize gravity. And so that's just a little bit of what we get. That's a, that's a really tiny amount. There's a lot more, but uh, that's just a little tiny amount for the moment on what happens if we assume the universe is 6,000 years old. And mainly of, of a paramount importance, let me say this. Each bit of this is mathematically provable. These are not empirical results, these are facts. One of the hard parts of the 6,000 year deal is we've got to prove our way through. Okay? We cannot chance our way through. When we hop from one empirical hypothesis empirically formed hypothesis to another empirically formed hypothesis. We can't rely on sufficiently high probabilities. The zero to 6,000 year cosmology, how does it differ in the large? Well, it's not for, it's not for weaklings because at each stage, at each juncture, Whatever you want to get had best be provable, because if it is not provable, then it shall not be happening. So this is this is this is one of the uh, this is one of the, the the harder parts. In other words, the zero to six thousand year. is pure fact each stage of the way. And there's no way around that. We, we can't play make-believe. We have to go with fact. We have to go with pure, hard, difficult mathematics at times. Whether we want to or not, we cannot bypass it. We cannot shortcut it. We have to take the road God sets before us, and we have to prove our way through each point at a time, and it can become difficult. It can become exacerbating. It can become enervating. It can make you want to throw your work against the wall and walk out and become an atheist, at least for five or ten minutes until you've had a cup of coffee. 
and regain your sanity. It can make you want to kick the cat until you realize, hey, I don't even have a cat. But it is the most difficult, treacherous, arduous, wondrous, rewarding, luxuriant, opulent, beautiful, spectacular place. Where and only where else could a crystal fill the entire universe in a canopy form, even though some parts of that crystalline canopy appear to be invisible because they're actually crystal and dielectrics. Boy, oh boy, I mean, this is... But we had to prove it. We couldn't leave it to uh, conjecture. We had to prove it. We had to sort out all the weaknesses, and we had to prove it. The difference between this cosmology and every other cosmology is there is no room for error. Exquisiteness is, by definition, exactness. Absolute precision. No error. For that reason, we sometimes identify with the aesthetic notion of beauty. The word exquisite. That's fantastic. Well, exquisite is probably best reserved for God. Um, David, I'm finished. I, I, I'm... I'm uh, do, do you want to say something? Uh, no, that's that's fine. I was I thought you were finished, and I was going to just tie it off. But <laughs> oh no, go ahead. If you want to say something, fine. Uh, well, no, I was just going to say that's that's just uh, really fantastic. I I mean, you know, I I had read a few things, but I really had no idea, and you just connected all the dots. <laughs> you know, that's the, yeah, the, that's the important part. Is uh, you know, <clears throat> we <clears throat> we don't have any room for error in this one. Uh, it's got to be shown all the way through. If, if you know, no guessing, <clears throat> no game playing. Uh, you, you've heard applied to Christians. You know, you're gonna, you, you, you know, I'm gonna prove you. You're gonna have to prove yourself uh, to yourself, and others are gonna prove you. And life is about being proved and proved over again and reproved, which from which comes the word reproof. You know. Hmm. And uh, uh, the whole point is, the reason why those words are in the English language is because those who follow God are going to find themselves, you know, don't tell me I'm calculating the same subgroups of this stupid group again, you know, doing the same junk again, you know. Uh, it can become monotonous, it can become boring, it can become, but it's got to be proven. At each state, there must be a proof. Every state. Stage is connected to the other by proof. There is no room for error. There is no room for speculation. The difference, that is probably one of the most important. I'm glad you brought that up. What is the difference? The difference between this one is, uh, I wouldn't be so hasty as to say, you know, something like, you bet your life, because you, you may well be betting your life. And if you can't prove it, you lose it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's that's the uh, that's the distinction between this one. It is it is essentially in in these terms a matter of life and death. And uh, you know it's it's it, it's probably one of the more extraordinary cosmologies uh, that there is because I know of no field wherein we have to prove ourselves at each point. We're allowed to make assumptions. We're allowed to. Uh, go off on speculation. We're allowed to... In this field, if our assumption works, we have to prove it. And so that is probably the most... Uh, uh, that is probably one of the most difficult parts is with the patience. We have to have patience. Uh, Especially when it, 
not only in this field, but when dealing with other people, especially in teaching. We have to understand how other people feel, how they think. I cannot teach to a class or to a group of students unless I understand their needs. And the only one who can explain that best is God Almighty. And God doesn't have to prove it, but sometimes... I ask God to prove it for a particular reason, uh, to point out something that I, that I need called to my attention. That is not testing God or putting God to a foolish test. Uh, that is asking God to show you what you need uh, to, to, to face a particular situation or to resolve a particular situation or a question or a need. There's a big great difference there. Hmm. So 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 we have to be attentive, but at each step of the way it's about obedience. Because ultimately the only one who can do all of this in a relaxed way, with never becoming frustrated, is God Almighty. You know? That's one of the reasons this is such a strenuous field. Mm -hmm. It requires, you know, the books I have to carry with me. Yeah. <laughs> and I helped edit most of those books. I know yeah. what's in most of those books. I can't remember them, you know. But what was it, five tubs of books? I don't remember. I think I, I, think I estimated it at 400 pounds. <laughs> 400, pound, 400 pounds of books, you know, and uh, good grief, you know. Uh, most people don't carry around 400 pounds of books. Uh I, I do know. I do know this much. If I, if, if the book were not given me, I helped edit the book, or helped write the book, or maybe I wrote. The, I don't even know if I had any of the books I wrote with me. I, I can't even remember. All I know is this: it's so easy to forget. I can't remember who said what, or what was said, or how the result went in its entirety. There are so many results. And just think about it. I could sit down across the table from God having a cup of coffee, and he can remember everything about uh, who said what, when, where, how, and uh, what they meant. Mm -hmm. And I have run into people like that, brilliant people like that, and it's been frightening. And uh, because... because and it's also, it, the reason it was frightening was, gee, I, I was thinking to myself at the time when I was frightened, not how this person could enhance me or or bless me with the amount of knowledge they have. No, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about, gee, this guy could make me look stupid. <laughs> you know, and what's that got to do with anything? But the whole point is, that I'm glad you asked that question because we're going now into the realm of 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 of, of, of the egoic, the self. You know, the, the that that, uh, that that inward journey that uh, that uh, that uh, we have to follow on, on a daily basis uh, in, in some disciplinary way, and and really, you know, it, it's it's. This this notion of the difficulty we've got to fit, we've got to adhere. As though we were tangent planes, we've got to adhere to that particular model which we created. Because if we don't, we are going to fall off completely and it's going to be all over and you know that's it it's about being exact as God said we could be you remember that phrase be ye perfect as your father is heaven is, is, is also perfect yeah yeah <clears throat> be a tangent plane stick to that manifold that describes that 6,000 year model <laughs> You know, slide along it, you know? Really, if we think about that manifold, if we're stuck to 
to it like a tangent plane, and we can slide along it smooth, no friction. It's like glass, a solid surface, very smooth. It, it takes a lot of the, it's similar. It's similar. What he said is is as similar as take take my yoke upon you, for it is light. My burden is light. And 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 also it uplifts us. It supports us. We rest on that. The uh, the Almighty and His creation. You know, if we if we 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 live in there and we still have the good old Garden of Eden not far away. That's the beauty of it. Granted, we have we have uh, given up our we forfeited our right to to be able to observe that Garden of Eden. Uh, and and live, you know, we we, we 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 as humans blew it in that respect. But it's nice to know that it's uh, it's it's memory still still is with us, and that uh, that that old garden is still around somewhere, being tended to by a Father in heaven who ain't gonna let anything go to the devil. You know, he's gonna reclaim everything on the planet. It's all about reclamation. God was the first ecologist. He really was. He's all about recycling and reclamation. Mm-hmm. 